Okay, so welcome to Sparky Guide to Bug Free JavaScript. My name is uh, Mita Mitreski, and I work for a small Dutch company called Tricode. And I'm also a JAC leader of Java user group Macedonia. Um, it's an interesting thing that the JAC leader will be talking about JavaScript, but it's something that uh, I believe it's a really important topic, and specifically the debugging of, of JavaScript applications. Now, uh, Sparky is not some kind of framework. Uh, it's just sort of like a flashy presentation of top 10 debugging uh, tips, uh, stuff that I have found interesting and I'm, I'm using on a regular basis, and I had stuff that I have found that other people uh, are missing, actually. Um, one of those is actually the debugger statement. This is sort of the most uh, underused uh, statement, in my opinion. Um, really simply, we just add uh, in our R code where we want to end up with a breakpoint, we add this debugger statement. So when our code reloads, uh, the browser uh, development tools will stop at this, this point. Um, this sounds really simple. Uh, then why don't we just set up the breakpoint uh, manually? The problem is that uh, most of the times in, in real life applications, uh, you have various of JavaScripts that are minimized, con con and you do not have the, the full scope of the, the uh, build process. It's sometimes you're loading A-B testing tools for, from other sites, or it's completely asynchronous. And the simplest way to actually add the breakpoint is just to add it in the code and uh, reload the page, and basically the breakpoint will stop there. Um, visually, this is in Chrome developer tools. We add the debugger statement. It stops like any other normal breakpoint. Now. Next, next up is sort of this console object. The console object is something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of the developers use it. Uh, they use this console log. But there's more to it, actually. Um, this is supported in most of the major browsers. Not all the functionality is sort of standardized. Um, usually, Chrome is the one who, who has uh, most of these features. Uh, but now, nonetheless, um, most, of the, most of them are added in, in the other browsers as well. So beside console lock, there is also error warning, debug, and so on. So we can actually um, add other different uh, logging levels. We can filter them out. But um, this is sort of the most basic thing that we, we can do in our application. Of course, there are a lot of other front-end frameworks that we can attach, and they can have like better logging and, and so on. But this is sort of the most basic thing that most applications do not have. Um, one other cool thing about the console object is an overview of uh, big JavaScript objects. So there is a beer list from Opera Beer database. Suppose you're in Belgium, and you need to pick a beer. Uh, and yes, there is this Open Beer database. And you have this list of beers from the API. But the problem is you cannot really visually see the beers, you know? You're going to have to go through the list of objects and click through, through, through it, which is not really all that practical. A simple, a simple way to, to avoid this is by using console.table. So by calling console.table on any JavaScript object or, or list or, uh, or maybe, yeah, basically JavaScript object, um, you're going to get a lovely little table in, in Chrome DevTools. And in that table, you can actually end up selecting uh, a good beer or multiple beers and so on. You can filter them out by some sort of score or, or any parameter that's inside this list of the object. Um, yeah, so um, I, we, sometimes we want to know really uh, how, how did the method got called and what's the actual call trace. There is simply console.trace, which can be added also into our functions. It will give us the, the call trace of, of, the, of the method. Quite simple, actually, and nothing more to say about it. It's really simple to, let's say, Java stack traces and so on. <clears throat> What's interesting is that we can do with this console trace is combine it with some other uh, standard JavaScript functionalities. Now, in the newer versions of JavaScript, there is something called objects observe. So suppose we have this person object. And that person object, we want to see who is changing our attributes in it. We don't, don't know really um, which JavaScript or uh, which, uh, in which part of the application this is being changed. 
We simply attach with objects observed all the listeners of all the mutations of this type of object. And we can actually call the trace uh, there and see from where our object got changed. Really simple way to, to figure out who is changing our object. Our, uh, of course, originally this functionality is not intended for, for debugging, but it's, it, it's a nifty little tool to have. Um, one other thing is this um, async debugging. So most of the JavaScript applications nowadays are all callback-based or promise-based or whatever. I mean, uh, more, more of the, most of them have these anonymous closures. And we want to actually have the whole stack of the callee. We don't want to have just the scope of the stack trace that's within the closure, but we want to have the full stack, the actual callee of the function. And just by clicking async, we, we get this. This is something specific to Chrome developer tools, but still, still a, a great thing. Now, this is cool for, for objects, but what happens if something is changed onto my DOM, uh, uh, DOM tree? And I don't know who is changing it, actually. There is maybe some script from, I don't know, some other application that I'm loading it in some way. But I want to figure out who's changing it. There is uh, something called mutation observers. Um, there are other mechanisms to actually achieve the, the same thing. But with mutation observer, we, we attach, uh, we actually observe an element, and we observe all the events that occur on that element. So changing an attribute on the element, or, I don't know, adding subchild elements, and so on. This will, this will uh, sort of give us all that, all that, uh, all that information. Uh, most of the development tools now are, are adding this as part of their standard tooling, so right-click on the HTML enables this. Uh, they are using uh, the older version of mutation events, but this is more of a programmatic uh, approach to, to, the, to the same, uh, same problem. Um, one other thing I have found that most applications do not have, and it's really simple to develop, is server-side logging of client-side uh, errors. Client-side errors, yeah. It's not events. Um, basically, we do not have an information when, when a browser crashes on some other computer. So when the client uh, has some kind of JavaScript error, I don't know, he's using I version 7, and in I version 7, some, something is not supported, and we didn't cover that scenario, we do not have that information. And really simply, we can have that, get that information. We just attach uh, event listener to the own error. So any exception that's being propagated uh, uh, to the top of, uh, of the execution, uh, we can send an AJAX request and actually log it on the, on the back end. We can log it in our servlet. We can log it on some REST endpoint. And it's a really simple thing that we can do. There are more advanced frameworks that, that allow us to get a lot more information. But uh, yeah, in general, this is more than enough to cover, to cover our, our basic scenario of, of failures. Actually, there is a nice little hack regarding this. So um, there isn't really an excuse for you not to, to, to have this. Uh, most of us have this uh, either Google Analytics or some other analytics. And we can actually sort of uh, log this information there. It's not the original intention of, of the analytics application, of course, but it's a really simple thing to have, and you can add this on any website. It doesn't have to be a full-fledged application, so, so nice little thing that to have and, and get the errors from, from your clients. Um, one sort of other theme that's been going on uh, is that JavaScript is not real code. Um, I know, I mean, I, I've been that guy. Um, I mean, the, the past few years, there has been a huge evolution in the, in the JavaScript stacks. And just ignoring it will actually hurt you and your company and your clients eventually. Um, there is a whole lot of tooling uh, regarding JavaScript. There are a whole lot of frameworks there. And treating it as, an, as a, something that you have to write instead of treating it as a real code will cause you problems. I have seen developers that uh, basically uh, have solid Java, Java application, the backend is fully tested, everything is next to perfect, let's say. But the front end, on the other hand, um, has no test at all. It doesn't work on certain versions, and they are not treating it as a real code. Don't do this. Don't be that guy. Basically, um, to sort of wrap it up, 
Uh, you shouldn't really get into this state where you need this type of tooling. <laughs> Try to, to sort of catch the problem sooner. Have, have a proper, proper build setup for the JavaScript part, not, not just as we have for the Java applications. Use the best practices, and you probably won't get into a situation to debug stuff. But if you do get combination of logging, combination of the functions in the console object, the debugger statement will give you a whole lot of, whole lot of uh, um, leeway to, to sort of fix your, your issues. Unless, of course, you really don't like using debuggers, you, you want to uh, sort of fix the problem on their own. Um, yeah, that's it for me. It's kind of a shorter topic, but yeah, I found these things that are really important. And yeah, you can, we can answer actually a few questions because we have time now. Uh, and yeah, on Twitter, hash, hashtag bug. Um, yeah.